Hi everybody, this is Nick from AVLI. I'm doing a bit of an impromptu video today on gamification by request. Um, this is gonna be very, I'm, I'm sticking to the free screencast-o-matic, so I only have 15 minutes, which is a challenge for me anyway. Uh, but in this particular topic, gamification, uh, well, I've already wasted 20 seconds, so I should just get going. Um, all right, so gamification, for whatever reason, garners a little bit of controversy, uh, especially from traditional teachers who think that that to gamify the classroom, which we'll talk about in a second, means to make it make it silly, make it fun, uh, and to sort of take the rigor out of it, um, which of course they they deem as necessary uh, to to simulate the rigor of of college, right? Like we're going to simulate the rigor of college by making this rigorous. You don't like exams in in college? The only way we can make sure that you're ready for that is by making exams in high school hard, and uh, rigorous and dry and boring because that's what we're testing you on is if there's this big, like there's this long game, right? Like we need to teach you how to deal with boringness. That's, that's school. Um, what, what gamification does is kind of takes the baby lion cub approach, or maybe if you see some puppies rolling around in the backyard, they're having fun. Um, they're, they're playing a game, but the, but the game is simulating something that they, that they need biologically like lions playing uh is is fun for them but if you watch as they get older they they're practicing like actual hunting techniques that they're going to use when they become whatever part of the of the pride that they become right so um th it's it's no different really that what you're trying to do with gamif gamification can be extremely authentic and it can be extremely difficult and in a lot of ways it takes the um it takes the the tension between teacher and student away. Let me give you a great example. Here is Super Mario Brothers. Um, now I really like to play games, but I'm gonna play this. This is a, a game that I think everybody knows here. And uh, so you gotta stomp on this guy and then you get get these coins, you get this mushroom and now you get big. Okay, and okay, now someone might might look at this and say, this is this is a waste of time. Okay, this is a waste of time. You're mushing your brain. My dad would say, oh, you're sitting around and playing video games all the time. Um, you're not learning anything. The fact of the matter is, I'm learning a lot. Okay, I am absolutely learning a lot. And this is a, a fact. It is a neurological fact that most people learn more from playing even video games, but games in general, they learn more from playing games than they do from any other, like from sitting in a classroom listening to a lecture, because it's it's experiential, first of all, and it's all it's trial and error, and it's risk free. Okay, now if I if I um, lose a man or or die in the game, it resets. I don't. It's not over forever. I can try again and try again and try again. I'm playing against a program that is previously completed. This thing is already made. Okay, there is no subjective judgment of a teacher coming in and and just picking favorites or deciding you know, uh, on the spur of the moment, how much something's worth or deciding that we're gonna have a quiz today or something like that. This is, this is a program that's already made and there are skills. Okay. These are, they're alternative skills. These are not skills that necessarily help you with anything in the real world, pressing the A button and the B button at the right time in conjunction with, you know, but it is a, it is something that helps you be successful in, in Mario brothers. Okay. So in fact, learning is happening without what, what, the argument is, is that the learning is not exactly what the school teacher wants them to learn. Okay. But like right here, there's a spot right here. Everybody knows this you jump up and there's, there's a one up mushroom right there. I could have got a free player, um, an extra, an extra life in the game. And this is a hidden box. This is a box that you would not know was there. It is not in the direction book and it does not tell you any introduction to the game where that happens. Um, you learn this through collaboration, you learn it through trial and error, you learn it from other people playing uh, and going over to their house and everybody sort of playing Mario Brothers together. And eventually it becomes sort of common knowledge based on not a Wikipedia page or a textbook, but just by like different people collaborating and experiencing together. And now sort of everybody in the video game world knows that there's a, a box right here that's hidden. Okay, it is just like a really common thing. Um, and when you when you look at games, Games do everything, and I'm not just talking about video games, I'm talking about any game. Games do everything that we 
want in terms of soft skills in the classroom. Okay, the, a game requires that the player um, keep trying when they when they lose in order to win. You can't just stop. Um, a game requires more and more today collaboration, both board games and uh, video games. Uh, a game um, a game requires uh, tenacity. A game requires that people are going to put in long hours, right? And these are things that we we sort of think, oh, well, the ki- the, the the student these days that this just doesn't do that. And the truth is, the student does do that. The student do- doesn't do that in our class. The student does that with with video games, and they do it with um, they do it with sports, and they do it with uh, board games. Like, what if there's a sim- some sort of simulation that get they get interested in? They will absolutely display every last characteristic that we want them to display in the classroom to be successful students. They're just learning. We don't have control of what they're learning. Okay. Um, so if you want a little, if you want to add a little vigor to your classroom and you want to see, you want to see students actually enjoy learning and learn because enjoying learning, liking you, the teacher, uh, those things help learning. Those don't go against learning. And there is no reason for someone to hate learning while they're learning it. There is not there is not a reason that someone needs to hate it in order to eventually do well in college. In fact, you could argue, like my, my I, I know someone well who did quite well in grade school and high school and got burned out. They, this person got burned out because of how, how quote unquote, rigorous it was. This is a college preparatory academy, okay? This person goes to college and is pulling C's and D's, makes it through, everything's fine. I'm not, it's not a, bad, not a bad person. It's just that this person got burned out in, in high school. And if it were treated differently, it might've had more energy when, when it came around to college, even if college did not follow the same, the same prototype. Okay, so um, the, the other aspect of gamification is that you... you I've talked about this in another video. You create this idea of teacher and student versus the game, as opposed to student versus teacher and whatever teacher precipitously decides today. You know, like I decide as teacher whimsically that I would like to have a quiz today because you guys didn't read or something like that. Like I'm feeling vindictive or, you know what? It's Christmas, uh, um, day before Christmas break. I know you guys didn't read, but no quiz. And everybody's like, yeah, this guy's awesome. Right? Like that's all just that's like the decision of a king deciding to kill this joker and keep this joker around. It's just completely, completely up in the air. It is, it is based on, on whimsy. It is not based at all on, on objectivity. Uh, And in fact, it it creates implicit biases in the classroom and uh, who was here when this happened versus, you know, who was having a good day this day. If you create the, if you create a game um, in the class, and these can take a lot of a lot of formats, right? Like what you're doing is creating a system, and you, and as long as it's well planned, uh, the teacher becomes kind of like the guide through that game, uh, someone that can help through the game, but it's not someone who is making up the game as they go along. Okay, so really, game good game design is really just good good uh, curriculum design. It's good sequencing. Uh, it's good scaffolding, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what I've what I've complete made in my class is a game. Uh, by which the students go through a role playing game. Each 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 student is a character in the game. They don't make their own character. They are the character. Okay. And the the worlds of the game are the the literature that we read in our classroom. So this is the first unit, and this is the Theban plays. And so the students, as they read the stories, they go through these these different um, quests will pop up, and these are the red ones are optional. So they can do they decide how they're going to make their grade. Uh, and here they would meet, they meet Ismini, which is Antigone's sister. And based on the text, they have to find, read, and summarize a secondary source that agrees with Antigone and try to argue against Ismini here, who thinks Antigone should not be doing what she's doing. So they get two points for this toward their grade. Uh, but then the points themselves are divided into two two categories, which I'll show you, show you later. Okay, so the students try to get to 100 points, and they choose these different adventures that they can go on based on the text. Some of these are even just like building things. They don't have to do this. They can. Um, and then there's a number, like I put asterisks here, which is the number of, of people that can be in a group for each of these. Okay. Now, once they get to 10 points, they can now move up to level two. Okay. And, and there's a narrative that goes on. So in, in this one, they've escaped from the allegory of the cave or from the cave, from the allegory of the cave. They don't want to go back in 
and so they they run away and they end up in in uh in thebes here and they end up as part of the theban plays and then they get icarus's wings and fly over here to fly away from these these guards and um they uh they now have an opportunity they get a chance to write this essay that they're going to throw in the water uh to try to, somebody to try to save them and when they eventually get to this point then beowulf uh gets it and comes by you have to suspend your chronology here beowulf comes by and and saves you and then you end up in level two which is beowulf and you're in beowulf here and you're doing these quests to help beowulf and his group this is of course you're concomitantly reading the uh the story okay and so as these guys are doing this i say guys it's all it's all boys at my school um i am i am putting these different scores into these categories here these are all the reading skills that we're working on in, in the first semester and the writing skills are over here and then from here this is a program that i've made where i can i can determine who's doing well in each skill based on the ones that they actively decide to do uh and who are who's struggling in, in ones versus uh based on ones they are avoiding and could still be getting a great grade they're just not they're just not picking activities that involve these skills right um and I can I can then remediate where necessary, or I can decide. I put like an average thing at the bottom, so I know which one uh, which ones of these different students are gravitating toward. And from then from there, I can kind of say like, okay, right here, 0.64. Go back up. That's inference. Uh, we need to do some activities in class involving inference because people are just skipping inference uh, and are getting a good grade anyway. But that, that's what they need to be taught. And I can tell based just on formatively assessing activities that they do decide to complete and then this information i can use for all sorts of stuff i use it i can use this to make um you know a different test for every student when we get to the exam um you can use this for great for groups i can determine which group people are in maybe i want it so that uh we have groups where there's an expert on each skill in each group or maybe i want it so that all of the people that struggle in one skill are all in the same group and this is where your your sort of teaching and and uh classroom management and stuff comes in um but uh, the students are building their grade based on going through, based on going through this game here, and I and then I'm using that for, uh, for teacherly purposes. But again, these things that they're completing, and, and I and I grade them anonymously, right? So they hit, they get a ticket like a um, like a raffle, and that's their number. They put that number at the top of everything, and then I grade it, and then I just say when I'm passing it back, like who was number oh six seven five four, and it's almost like you won the. Um, the door prize at a trivia night or something. Some kid, oh, that's me, that's me. And he stands up and he goes to pass the thing back. I don't even know whose it was. And they're allowed to redo anything. They can redo anything they want uh, because the feedback is is authentic and it's based on on the work. And if they want to redo it, they can redo it. It just like just like Mario Brothers, right? If I go here and I run off the side, okay, that means that my that life is over. Look at this. I get to go again. Okay, and where I messed up, I can actually try to make it past that this time. Okay, and if I make it past that, I've created a sort of best, personal best for myself. Oh, right there. Okay, I did it. Not hard. I'm not saying that was that was difficult, but I am saying that I learned based on failing. Okay, and so something like this allows for the student to fail, um, and uh, and then learn learn from that the way that games do. Okay, now this is just, this is a very extreme example of gamification. Gamification can take can take the form of including game design elements in your grading system, like not keeping the keeping the classroom the same. You don't change anything. You just change what you grade to make it fit more of a of a point total, like you're totaling up points. Or it can take take like even something like Jeopardy, which I know everyone does. Jeopardy in the classroom would be a form of gamification. You're complete. You're introducing competitive elements. Okay, so gamification is not this this is gamification right all apples are fruit but not all fruit are apples and so this is this is an example that i have come up with i include classroom games in in this i include you know like the team games that i that i'll create uh maybe i should do an, a video on that as well um but all i mean it's really a choose your own adventure and take as much as you're as you're interested in i've encouraged a lot of teachers at my brick and mortar school to just kind of like Hey, just do one lesson of game that's gamified. See how that works, and maybe build up. See if you like it. And there have been two or three teachers that have really taken off and, and done that. Um, but anyway, please contact me if you have any more 
uh, questions about this, I'd love to talk about it more, but I have two seconds left. Thank you.